good stuff. <coughs> So again, I want to talk today about some basic um, positioning principles. So positioning and terminology is where we're starting here. Uh, let's just kind of remind ourselves of some basic terminology. And uh, obviously Yolanda, it's, it's for the first time, learning some basic terminology here. Um, and Lewis too. So the terms we use in radiography. Radiography is the, um, the field right, the field of creating x-rays, right, creating radiographs. So what's a radiograph? A radiograph is basically a recording of radiation that's passed through somebody's body, and okay, that's essentially what it is. We use radiation, we use x-rays to um, create an image, right, and uh, the way we do that is we basically take and we have like it's similar in, in function to a, like a flashlight, except it emits x-rays instead of visible light and uh, that those x-rays they shine through the patient's body and um, the stuff that makes it through the patient's body will expose an image receptor behind the patient okay. and the way we position their anatomy in front of the image receptor uh, will determine like what we see on the receptor as well as the um, the orientation in which we see it so for example a hand can be shown in several different ways depending on the way you position the hand so a radiograph is that recording. Sorry, Michael. Um, we're, we just got started. Um, so the radiograph is the recording. It's it's the uh, X-ray, the piece of film you'd be looking at, or the digital X-ray you'd be looking at, like like here on the screen now. Uh, whereas radiography is the entire field of creating X-rays. So we're just taking good notes, um, and uh, yeah, we're just taking good notes some, uh, and stuff on positioning here. Um, okay. So our radiographs are traditionally, traditionally as in nowadays, they're viewed digitally. We view radiographs as soft copy images on a computer screen. X-ray film, well if we're going to say X-ray film, X-ray film would be unexposed uh, piece of film. Uh, once the X-rays have struck the film and exposed the film, we now have a, a radiograph. It would of course need to be processed if it's a piece of film. Um, by the way, we talk uh, here and there about film radiography. Film radiography is less commonly used nowadays, still exists, um, but works very similarly to, um, to, to film photography. So the same stuff happens. You know, the, the film has an emulsion, which is the stuff that gets exposed on the piece of film, and um, that's put through a processor, and, and the processor does its development. Um, it stops the processing, and then it, it ultimately washes the film. But uh, all the same things happen to film radiographs that happen to film photographs. Primarily, though, nowadays we use digital radiography. So we view our images as soft copy on the computer screen. Radiography is the field. Radiograph is the image. Radiographic procedure is the exam done to create the image that we're asked to create. So for example, a chest x-ray might be ordered. And if a chest x-ray is ordered, it's typically two views. That entire setup, the entire um, activity of performing those two images is the radiographic procedure. Occasionally, we'll refer to it as a radiographic study or a radiographic exam. All of those things mean the same thing. Radiographic procedure, study, and exam all mean the same thing. What you're viewing on the left side of the screen is a PA chest x-ray. PA um, determines the position of the patient, and then the chest x-ray part of it tells us that we're imaging the chest. We talk about everything from anatomic position. Okay. Um, in anatomic position, uh, to, to be said to be in anatomic position, the patient would be standing feet shoulder width apart and facing towards you. Their palms should be facing out towards you with their arms hanging down at their sides. Their shoulders are relaxed. Their head is in a neutral position. They're not looking up, down, left, or right. In this anatomic position, everything facing towards you is considered to be the anterior of the patient. Everything facing away from you is considered to be the posterior of the patient. 
the sides of the patient are referred to as the lateral aspects or lateral surfaces. The planes of the body. Planes are, Im I don't want to say imaginary, but let's say imaginary. They're imaginary two-dimensional planes in which, uh, which divide the body up into things like a left and a right, a top and a bottom, a front and a back, or some other angle. Okay. Um, so what's, what does two-dimensional mean? Give me an example of something in this room that's two-dimensional. Yeah, the image on the screen, right? Um, a piece of paper, right? It's essentially two-dimensional, right? It really does have a thickness to it, but it's not much, right? Um, Lewis's example is actually perfect. The image on the screen is two-dimensional. Right? It has an up and a down and a left and a right. It, it is two-dimensional. Uh, oh, awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. So the planes of the body, they are imaginary two-dimensional structures, uh, as I said, which divide the body up. So um, let's talk about them. The one we talk most about is the one that divides the body up into an equal, I'm going to back up here, an equal left and the right. So it would divide the body up down the middle, making a left side of the body and a right side of the body. We call that plane the sagittal plane. It makes a left and a right. If you were aiming to make an equal left and a right, or for x-ray examples, if you were aiming to, to line the body up to the midline of the table, the midline of the body to the midline of the table, you would use the mid-sagittal plane. Mid-sagittal is an equal left and a right, whereas sagittal just says, I'm dividing the body into a left and a right, not exactly equal though. Coronal. Coronal plane divides the body into front and back, or like anterior and posterior. Mid-coronal shown uh, labeled here, mid-coronal divides the body into as equal as possible front and back, whereas coronal just says front versus back, not equal. What's the only plane we can actually div be divided up equally? Mid-sagittal. Mid-sagittal. It's the only one that divides the body into equal. Now, um, I don't know if you, there's um, tons, of the, tons of photo software now that you can have on your phone. Has anyone ever done the photo editing software where it takes half of your face and makes it the other half of your face? You look weird, right? Yeah, everyone looks weird. Our faces aren't equal left and right. Neither is the rest of our body. Okay? It looks weird if we were to take half of our body and copy it and mirror image it to the other side. So we are not exactly equal left to right, but because us and most animals have to move in one direction as we go through the world, we have a front in front of us and a back behind us, it kind of makes our body set up to be uh, unequal front to back, but equal from left to right. We have to make equal amounts of left and right movements. Most animals do, but most animals have a front direction that they move and a back direction that they move. So for that reason, we don't have an equal front and back. Our fronts and backs are separate, but the left to rights somewhat, for the most part, equal, we can say. So uh, the other two planes the, I'm going to jump down to the axial plane or horizontal plane. Um, the best wording is, that should be used for that is actually not even written on here. It's the transverse plane. The transverse plane is a plane which divides the body into top and bottom. And then lastly, lastly on purpose, um, all of these, the three that I just mentioned were all like 90 degrees from each other. They're all separated by 90 degrees of angle to each other. The oblique plane is the only one that's not done like that. The oblique plane uh, runs through the body at odd angles. We won't, we typically don't use the oblique plane when we're talking about positioning unless we're performing images that are considered to be oblique images. So we'll get to talk about them, but the three major planes of the body, sagittal, coronal, and horizontal or transverse. So knowing what you know now, 
what plane of the body is demonstrated here? If, if those circles at the top are the eyes and nose, and the back is the back of the skull, the bottom of the image is the back of the skull, what plane is shown here? Transverse. Transverse plane, good. How about the image on the left? Okay, the image on the right? I know you're looking at images you've never seen before, but take a, take a stab at it. Coronal. 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 Dividing the body into fronts and backs. So these are um, MRI images. Um, these are done via what's called magnetic resonance imaging, where they use magnets to align the cells of, or the uh, atoms of our cells and create, create really interesting images. Um, MRI has the distinct advantage that it can show many tissue densities. Whereas, for example, x-ray radiographs can only show roughly four to five different tissue densities. Um, we can only pick up things like muscle, fat, bone, uh, air, and so forth, uh, metal, uh, prosthesis. prosthesis. Um, but MRI has this advantage that it can show many shades, uh, many different densities. So we can see things on MRI that we can't see on a radiograph. For example here, you're seeing the brain on an MRI can't really see the brain so well on a radiograph. Um, you're seeing the spinal cord on this MRI, at least the sagittal MRI. Um, and you're also seeing the muscle and the air spaces and all of these structures are visible on MRI that are not visible on a radiograph, just worth mentioning. But you are right about the planes of the body here. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk briefly about the front versus the back. So from anatomic position, remind yourself that everything facing towards you on, of that patient is their front or anterior surface. We have another word for anterior, and it's ventral. Ventral also means the front of the body. That's the wrong drink. Oops. Whatever. Posterior. Posterior, uh, we said, means the back of the body. Um, there's another word for that. We can say dorsal surface. Uh, does anyone have a way? Is there an easy thing we can use in nature to remember this? Front and back. Front and back. Front and back, yeah. Um, just for me, it was always easier to remember ventral and dorsal because um, dolphins and fish have a fin on their back called their dorsal fin. So if you know any kind of uh, um, marine biology, you can go ahead and remember that one real easily. But if it doesn't work for you, it's okay. Anterior is the front, posterior is the back, dorsal is also the back, ventral is also the front. It gets weird though, down at the feet. The feet change things a little bit. With the top of the foot, if you look down at your feet with no, no socks on and shoes, the top of your foot that you can see, we don't call that the anterior foot. We call it the dorsum of the foot, as in the dorsal surface of the foot. Think about it for a second, it doesn't really make sense, right? Because the dorsal surface is on the back, but we call the top of the foot the dorsal surface of the foot. So just accept that that's different and then move on. The bottom of the foot is not called the posterior foot. It's called the plantar surface. You may have heard of the medical condition plantar fasciitis before. That's a, a medical condition of the, of the sole of the foot, the plantar surface of the foot. All right, if the foot's got its own weirdness, you can bet the hand has its own weirdness too, okay? Um, with the hand, the back of the hand, this part of the hand is called the dorsum or dorsal aspect or dorsal surface. Those are all correct ways to word that. The palm of the hand, that's an easy one, palmar surface.
So let's now go through some basic body positions here. Um, this may be helpful as we do this to use our textbooks. Only because it labels the images and gives you some sort of explanation for each. So I have I have an older edition of the textbook, but I, it's chapter one. I have pages um, page eighteen and nineteen. So I expect you guys are probably page uh, twenty one and twenty two. Then something like that. You guys are usually two or three pages ahead of mine. So it's the page that shows all the body positions. Starting off with general body positions. Would you tell me what page that is in, in the book, Alberto? 20. 20, yeah, so you guys are always like a page or two ahead of me. Okay, good stuff. I'll get a new edition one of these days. As long as you guys have the most recent one, that's the important thing. So, okay, so basic body positions here. Uh, and I believe mine at least goes in order with the book, but on the left side of the screen, so body positions, um, you're always going to be told a body position for your patient. Um, now I'll tell you, you have to remember upwards of 40 different radiographic examinations, radiographic procedures. Each one of them has to be memorized entirely and each one of them has its own special positioning for the patient. That sounds like a lot to remember, but there is a lot of carryover from one exam to the next, a lot of things that are the same from one exam to the next. But that doesn't take anything away from the fact that there are something, something north of 40 exams you have to memorize. Each one of them will have a different body position, and that's, part of, that's one of the first things to consider with an exam is how do I put my patient in this room? Where in this room do I put them? Um, so let's talk about the positions and that way we can understand things better. I'll tell you this, almost any radiograph that you can perform uh, standing can be done laying down on the table. Okay? If you were trained by an older x-ray tech, somebody who's been in the field for 30 or 40 years, they'll tell you that same thing. They may even teach you ways to position the patients on the table that you've never seen uh, for, done, done in the standing position. Um, it is easy and easier in a lot of cases to position the patients from the tabletop rather than standing because laying down is inherently a little more stable than standing up. Okay? There are though certain radiographs which cannot be performed on the tabletop, that cannot be performed with the patient laying on the table in, in any position. Things like chest x-rays. Some chest x-rays, and, and all, and all and in, in, fact, in fact, all chest x-rays are done um, looking for things like fluid in the, in, the, in the chest and things like air in the chest. Um, well, just so happens that air goes up and fluid goes down, right? So if you lay a patient on the table, you can't see their air fluid levels in their chest. And that also works for the abdomen, but I don't teach, you guys don't learn the abdomen, but it, it also works there as well. So chest x-rays cannot be done on the tabletop, but almost any other radiographic exam, anything that's not looking for air fluid levels um, can be done on the tabletop surface. So the tabletop positions, um, the one on the left is called supine. Supine is a special position. Uh, it's very specific. Supine indicates that the patient is laying on their back with their legs extended and their hands at their side. Their head should be supported, but that's not a requirement to call it supine. Their head can be flat to the table. Okay. You notice the specificity there. Their legs are extended. Their hands are down at their side. They are resting their head looking up at the ceiling. All of those things are specific to that position. Go to the position on the right. It's called prone. Um, prone is also fairly specific. They're laying on their stomach, legs extended. The hands aren't so important in the prone position, but typically they're brought up here next to the head like they're shown. As long as the patient is not using their hand to lay on, because that will start to get them to roll their body to one side. Okay. 
tilting positions. Um, so let me just kind of take it from the medical standpoint first, not the radiography standpoint. From a medical standpoint, there are times when we would need to make a patient's head lower than the rest of their body, and also times when we would need to make a patient's head higher than the rest of their body. Um, can you guys think of a, re a time when we would need to uh, cause the head to be lower than the rest of the body from a medical standpoint? Like it, like the position on the left? Is there any time we'd want the head low? Shock position. Did you say shock? Yeah. Uh, that's the reason why. Have, anybody here ever fainted? Yeah? Do you remember what happened after you fainted? Um, yeah. Did anyone help you out? Yeah. Did they lay you down, stand you up? Well, my, it was my sister and she like, helped me fall. And then she didn't do the top of the thing because I woke up before. That's okay. But That's okay. They lift your legs. Yeah. So when we faint, for example, all of the blood will rush away from our head. Our body's smart, but it's not that smart. When your body uh, perceives that it's like under attack, it tries to protect the important stuff. And what the body sees as the important things are your uh, major organs in your trunk, the trunk of your body, the, your torso. So when um, when people faint, the blood rushes away from their head because their body's pulling the blood to the other areas, to the things like the heart and the lungs and the other major organs of the body. Um, so blood rushes away from the head and we faint, we lose consciousness. In a fainting event, it's important to raise the patient's feet above their head to promote blood flow back to the head. A physician told it to me like this, when the face is pale, raise the tail. Okay. <laughs> Sounds goofy, right? But it works. Get the feet up when the face is pale, like when the blood is rushing away from their head. And he also told me, when the face is red, raise the head. Okay, The opposite is true when there's excess blood flow to the head. Um, putting the patient in the uh, fowler's position on the right side um, with, the, with the head elevated when there's too much blood flow to the head. Typically, though, we have the problem of not enough blood flow to the head. And so the position on the left, the Trendelenburg position, so that's called the, on the, on the left with the head low, that's called the Trendelenburg position. And Lewis also got it, it's also called the shock position. In emergency medicine, this position is used to help blood flow back to the head. Face is pale, raise the tail. The face is red, raise the head. I'll never forget it. Okay. So Trendelenburg and Fowler's. Other general body positions. I didn't follow the book so well. But what you have here are these two are both lateral positions of the body. These are considered lateral positions of the body because the lateral surface of the body is touching the image receptor. So behind the patient on the on this, uh, let me get my laser pointer here. This board behind this patient here is the image receptor. For all intents and purposes, there's the image receptor. It might be in a in a might be in a slot behind that board, but either way, that's the image receptor. Okay. That means we're looking at the patient from this position. So essentially, the camera that shot this image was where the X-ray tube would be. Okay. Um, and the x-rays would pass through this surface of the patient and exit the other side of the patient, hitting this receptor. Because their right side is touching the board, this is a right lateral. So we, we call laterals by the side that's touching the image receptor, or that's closest to the image receptor. <clears throat> So on the right hand side here, this patient is also in a right lateral, because their right side is laying on the table. So sorry, this patient's sorry, this patient's in a left lateral, my bad. This patient's in a left lateral position because their left side is touching the table. The right side is up off the table. These are both laterals, right on the le right lateral on the left side of the screen, left lateral on the right side of the screen. Um, what's the difference? Not the right and left difference, but what's the major difference between these two laterals? 
one standing and one laying down, right? We say the standing position is called the erect position. Same with like with anatomic position, the patient is erect, they're standing. The erect position is standing. On the right hand side, the, the position of laying down on the table surface is recumbent. So if I put it all together on the right hand side of the screen, this person's in a left lateral recumbent position. The person on the left hand side here, the lady, she's in a right lateral erect position. Okay. Supine, prone, and your laterals, erect and recumbent, are some of the most important ones. Um, these others are also useful as well, but, but not as much for radiography. Like this position here, the lithotomy position. Okay. The lithotomy position is the position that's used primarily for pelvic examinations. Uh, the lithotomy position, uh, the female, it's typically for females. It can be used for male rectal exams too, uh, but not commonly. Male rectal exams are typically done from another position that I'll show you in a second here. Uh, but for, for mostly for female gynecological examinations, the lithotomy position is used. Um, the, the special parts about this is she's laying on her back. <clears throat> her uh, butt is scooted as close to the edge of the table as she can, and the legs are supported in stirrups. Okay. That's the big thing with the lithotomy, if the legs are supported in stirrups. Alternatively, the, the heels can be placed on the edge of the table, um, and, and basically the deal is she just scooted as close to the edge, of the, the edge of the table as possible. Traditionally, stirrups are used. This is most likely going to be done for some version of a surgical or radiographic examination because her legs are secured in these stirrups rather than just having her put her feet in the traditional stirrups. But that's lithotomy. This position here is called the modified SIMS position, or just SIMS. This is the position used for male rectal exams primarily, um, as well as can be used for, for male and female rectal exams. That's probably the primary reason for using this if you need access to the, to the rectum. There are radiographic reasons to do this position, although you won't need to do them as a limited permit x-ray technician. Yes? On Wednesday we had a knee, um, and the x-ray tag laid her down like that for the lateral. Yes. So she had to... It's bend. actually going to be recumbent. Oh, okay. I had to do one of these. Yeah, so it's recumbent because they're laying on their side and that's the important part. Um, the knee is going to be flexed here. This is the knee you're going to image, right? It'd be the side down. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the side down. This knee gets flexed and that's, for, for this to be Sims, this leg has to be straight. It's going to be a lateral recumbent. Um, and, and you're right, they, they brought the knee over like this though, right? That's, what, that's how I do it. Some people leave the knee for the lateral knee. They leave the knee back here behind the patient. It doesn't work. You have, to, you have to let that knee go over the other knee to rotate the knee into the correct position. That's a good one to see. I'm glad they're teaching it the right way there. That's a, that's a good deal. Uh, and it's a good facility. I, I didn't ever worry about it. <clears throat> okay. The next things here... Um, are two of the most, these are pretty much the most important thing I need to show you today. Projections, okay? Um, so when you get an order for a radiograph, it's gonna tell you to do, you know, X amount of images for whatever body part. When we, when we talk about the position of the patient, we talk about the position of the patient as if we're talking about the, the direction the X-ray beam traveled towards the patient. Meaning, the x-ray beam can either go in through the front of the patient, go in through the back of the patient, or enter the side of the patient, right? If the x-ray beam enters the front of the patient and exits the back of the patient, like that's shown here on the left, that, that by the way, if we didn't already have an idea, a few of us have been in an x-ray room, but some of us haven't, this is an x-ray machine, x-ray tube, this is the x-ray tube, or you can say, say x-ray machine for now, and behind the patient is the image receptor, the x-ray beam is coming from here, hitting the front of the patient, exiting the back, hitting now the image receptor to make an image. The opposite is true on the right-hand side. So this is what's called an anterior-posterior projection. 
I'm describing the path of the x-ray beam as it moves through the patient. The x-ray beam went through the anterior surface, then to the posterior surface, through the posterior surface. We would call this an AP projection, or if you wanted to expand it and say it correctly, anterior posterior projection. AP. Yeah. So when the patient's facing towards the x-ray tube, it's AP. Okay. When the patient is facing away from the x-ray tube, it's PA, or posterior anterior. It entered through the back and it exited out the front. <clears throat> For things like a chest x-ray, that matters. Uh, it matters for lots of things, but for things like a chest x-ray, it definitely matters. Um, if you didn't know this already, um, as something moves away from, from the image receptor, let's say, it gets magnified. And you can illustrate that very, very simply by simply just taking, can't get out of my app here, I need to go for it. By simply taking and making a shadow of your hand, even with the light on in the room, you can see the shadow of my hand, right? As I move my hand away from the board, my hand gets larger, yeah? Even with the light on, you can see that. Um, as a body part moves further from the image receptor, it is magnified. Now, in your chest, you have this big old muscle called your heart, right? And your heart sits very close to the front of your body. So if you take and position the patient in the AP position, the one on the left, the heart appears magnified for a chest x-ray. And the opposite is true for the PA position. The heart is minimized as much as possible. Um, so the positions are chosen for a good reason. For example, with the forearm, the forearm is performed in the AP position, not the PA position. Okay? It's done in the AP position because when we, when we put our palm down, when we put our palm down, these two bones cross over each other, like that. And it makes it so that you have two bones overlapping each other, where if you were to do it from the AP position, the bones are separated. Separate. Uh, so there's reasons to perform exams AP or PA, depending on the type of exam to be done. Uh, my goal for you guys is to learn what projection is used for all body parts. These two shown here are called oblique projections. Um, sometimes we'll speak a little bit incorrectly, and I, I'll do it all the time actually, and I'll say position rather than projection. We always mean projection though. We always mean the path of the x-ray beam. Okay. So obliques are, uh, see, I almost said it. Obliques are projections that are performed um, when we're not necessarily looking straight on at the body part, either flat or on its side. We take an angle of the body part in some interesting angle to show, uh, primarily it's done, obliques are done to show joint spacing. Okay. If you ask any x-ray tech, anyone who's been around for a while, they'll just tell you that. It's the easiest answer. It's not the 100% correct, but it's an easy answer to understand as you're starting out here. Okay. Obliques are done to demonstrate joint spaces. Okay. For example, this is an, um, let me just zoom in here. This is an oblique radiograph of the knee, and this one is done to demonstrate this joint space here. So the fact that you can see it look darker from this bone to this bone to see a space between them. That's the, by the way, it's the proximal um, tibiofibular joint. Not that you need to know that right now, but uh, these, this is an oblique of the knee. They basically internally rotated the knee from the AP projection and uh, were able to get an image like that demonstrating a joint space. So these are obliques. Obliques are done when we angle the body part in some interesting angle other than flat or lateral. Um, this is a anterior posterior, anterior posterior oblique. The x-ray beam is entering through the top of the foot or the front of the foot and exiting the bottom of the foot or, or back of the foot, plantar surface, so A to P. This 
This is the posterior aspect of the hand. The palm is the anterior. So this is a PA oblique projection of the hand. Hands we perform in PA. Feet we do from the AP uh, projection. And lastly, for extremities on the body, when we perform a lateral, a lateral position, projection, pardon me, and when we perform a lateral projection, the x-ray beam has to enter one side and exit the other side, right? It's always from the side, though, from, for lateral. Um, so the projection is either lateromedial or mediolateral. You're being told the path of the x-ray beam when you hear that word. Lateromedial means traveling through the lateral surface to the medial surface. Medial means closer to the midline of the body. So when you go to anatomic position, see over here so I can see, you go to anatomic position here and the palm is facing out, this is the lateral surface of my hand and wrist. This is the medial surface of my hand and wrist. Okay? Uh, if I'm doing a position, a projection like this, and the x-ray beam is coming down here, it's hitting the lateral surface and exiting the medial surface. Okay? Lateromedial. With the foot, it's the op or the, the, in this case, the ankle. With the ankle, it's the opposite. Putting the ankle on the table um, allows the x-ray beam to hit the medial aspect of the ankle first and exit out from the lateral aspect of the ankle. Okay. All right, I'm gonna give you a few more things. This one's, I don't, I have to tell you because it's just part of the deal, but um, don't get confused. So we talk about radiographic projection, right? Which is the path of the X-ray beam. Outside of the United States, they don't always do things the same as we do. And it, I don't know if they're better or worse, but it's at least different. Uh, they don't, outside of the US, they don't describe things as the radiographic projection or the path of the X-ray beam. They describe things as from the standpoint of the image receptor. So everything's backwards outside of the United States, or maybe we're backwards here, who knows. Um, they describe things from the radiographic view which is the, the viewpoint from the image receptor. So picture yourself, instead of being the x-ray beam traveling through the patient, you're now the image receptor looking out at the patient and the x-ray tube. The way you see things from that viewpoint is how we would describe them. So instead of like a chest x-ray, where we would, let me back up here. Like a chest x-ray like this, the image on the left would be an, uh, uh, an uh, a uh, PA view instead of an AP projection. See how that's just different? It's just exactly opposite of what we do here, okay? So just know that uh, we, we don't have the, we're not the final say in the world, okay? The world uses, does things differently than we do, um, and that can be good or bad, right? We use the standard system of measure, everywhere else uses the metric system, and, and uh, personally, the metric system is better, okay? Um, who knows if this is better or worse? I, I was trained on, on projections and so will you be and uh, you're gonna think it's better maybe, right? But you don't, we don't know. It's just different. It's just exactly opposite of the way we talk about things in, from the projection standpoint. So it describes the body part as seen by the image receptor or other recording medium such as the fluoroscopy screen. Either way, it's from the image receptor. So it's exactly backwards. All right, so positioning principles here. We're gonna to need to reinforce this with every exam we talk about, okay? Accuracy, accuracy is so important. Um, is the x-ray beam potentially harmful to a patient? Yes. Um, 
Why? Because it's, it's got this quality where it can break apart atoms, right? It can, it can do this thing called ionizing, where it breaks apart our atoms. We are made of atoms. Our DNA is made of atoms. Our cells require DNA to, to replicate, right? So we can damage our cells potentially by exposing them to ionizing radiation. Uh, so we've got to make sure we're being as accurate as possible so that we limit the number of repeat radiographs that we would need to perform. I'll just give it to you right now. An x-ray tech should repeat no more than 5% of their radiographs. Okay, so if you did 100 radiographs, you shouldn't be repeating more than five of them. Okay, That's, that's the standard. And uh, I hold my x-ray techs to about half of that, okay? about 2.5% uh, for a repeat standard. So I think that's where you guys should be aiming for. Now, as a student, I repeated x-rays all the time because I was learning. And that's kind of the deal. You've got to learn how to do them, right? Somebody's got, somebody at some point has to take their hands off and let you hold the wheel, right? And you're going to make some mistakes, and that's okay. Just try to limit the mistakes that you're making. Learn from your mistakes, too. That's the biggest thing, right? Um, everything that I know how to do well, I learned it because I did it wrong one time, okay? So just learn from your mistakes and don't make them again. Uh, accuracy is super important for us. So what do we want to make sure of? Whatever exam we're performing, this does not per pertain to just this forearm exam, but it doesn't matter. All pertinent anatomy demonstrated. Okay. So today, I'm going to teach you guys about chest x-rays today. Okay, we're getting into cold and flu season. We've got to learn about chest x-rays. Okay. Um, so I'm going to teach you about chest x-rays. It's one of the most uh, commonly performed exams. Um, and you got to make sure you show all the anatomy. Okay, I'll talk to you about what anatomy needs to be shown for a chest x-ray. If you are doing multiple images on one image receptor, which you really shouldn't be, make sure they're lined up, make sure they're all straight, make sure one's not diagonal, the other's straight, the other's the other direction, right? You want them all one, two, three, straight, lined up across the image receptor. It's harder than it sounds. Um, collimation, okay? See the light here? The light shown here on the, on the field? There's your image receptor, there's the patient's body part, and there's a light field. We call that the collimated field. Collimation is making that field larger or smaller. You can understand if you make the collimated field too small, you may cut off certain anatomy. The collimated field is representative of the radiation field. It is not the radiation field and it is not exactly the same size as the radiation field. It's very, very close to the same size. Okay? It's accurate to within approximately eight tenths of an inch. So roughly three quarters of an inch there can be offset between the light field that you see and the actual radiation field. They're not perfectly accurate, but they're pretty close. So that's important, right? I'll tell you always leave one inch of light field on all sides of your body because the x-ray beam field and the light field shown can be mismatched by as much as three quarters of an inch. So if you always leave yourself an inch, no matter how much the mismatch is, you will never miss anything. <clears throat> Rotation. Body parts should be rotated properly. Um, for example, in this position, this is the this is neutral rotation. They're not ro they have their hand their arm like this. They're not rotated palm down, and they're not rotated palm up, which is actually very hard from this position. Uh, but they're not rotated more than they should be. So the right amount of rotation to a body part. <clears throat> Lastly, on this is central ray. Everyone's used a flashlight. We know that the flashlight, when you turn them on, you shine it at a wall, there's a middle part of the flashlight beam, right? And it's always typically brighter than the rest of the beam, right? Um, and it's the part of the flashlight beam that's right in the middle, traveling straight from the flashlight, so it's traveling straightest, too. We call that the central ray, okay? It's the, it works for flashlights, and it works for the x-ray beam, too. There's a middle of the x-ray beam that is the straightest, and the strongest part of the x-ray beam. That's called the central ray, or CR. Um, do not confuse CR, central ray, with CR, computed radiography. They're just obviously different, right? You gotta look at the context, that, you gotta look at the context that you're reading the term in.
<clears throat> okay, so the central ray. In your positioning books, the central ray is always shown as like a wooden or metal dowel. Okay. <clears throat> the central ray um, is perpendicular to the image receptor for most exams, but there are exams where we would purposefully angle the central ray and um, to do things like purposely distort the way a body part looks. Um, has anyone done an exam where they angled the central ray? Yeah. Can you guys give me, maybe Alberto, give me an example of one oh, exam. The foot. The what? The foot. The foot. Um, which position, which projection of the foot <clears throat> did you have to angle it for? for the AP. AP. And uh, roughly how much angle did you have to use? 10. About 10, 10 what? 10 makes, degrees. 10 degrees towards the cephalic. head. Yeah, yeah cephalic, cephalic angle, right? So we purposely angled the x-ray tube so that it was not straight up and down to the image receptor so that it was angled a little bit to the image receptor. Is there a good reason why we had to do that? Why you had to do that? Is it for the metatarsus? Yeah. Let me, give, let me get a foot real quick so I can help, help elucidate that. <clears throat> okay. So, you got a foot, right? And uh, the foot has a bit of an arch to it like this. These long bones of the foot are not parallel to the receptor. They're sitting at an angle to the receptor. These, uh, they're angled roughly 10 degrees to the image receptor. So your foot angles like that, uh, the long bones do. If you angle the central ray straight down at the receptor, the bones will look shorter than they actually are. So what you do is you take your x-ray tube and you match the angle that these bones are at, and so they look the same size as they are in real life, as close to the same size as possible. Lewis, did you have an exam that you can call up? Uh, the C-spine. The C-spine. Which, which uh, view of the C-spine did you angle for? AP. AP view of the C-spine. Okay, let's go over to this guy. The vertebra of the neck. Let me get a pen so we can kind of line this up here. <clears throat> these vertebra, these cervical vertebra here on the neck, they actually sit at about a 15 degree angle downward, meaning the disc spaces, these, these discs between vertebra, the angle that they sit at is about 15 degrees pointing down towards the front of the patient like that. So what Lewis had to do is, with the x-ray beam, to be able to show, let me get this guy's head out of the road. to be able to show these joint spaces well, he had to take and he had to, you guys are the x-ray tube, right? He had to take and he had to angle his x-ray tube about 15, about 15 degrees, right? 15, it's 15 to 20, but about 15 degrees towards the head so that the x-ray beam went through those joint spaces and hit the receptor. And now we're able to see those joint spaces nice and open. If we just pointed it straight at the uh, neck, um, the joint spaces would appear closed up. And it just has to do with the fact that the, the body is angled in certain ways in certain areas. <clears throat> this guy's got an AC separation. <laughs> All right. So there's good reasons to create this angle to the body. Uh, and so the central ray, there's a lot of talk about the central ray in radiography. Okay. Evaluating a radiograph. Now this is not how to evaluate any radiograph. This is some basic things to look for. Look for the anatomy that should be demonstrated. This is a lateral forearm. What bones are the forearm, is the forearm made of? It's made of two, the radius and the ulna. So at a minimum for a lateral forearm like shown here, by the way, it's not put on the screen correctly, but that's a different talk. Um, on a lateral forearm like shown here, where I'm looking that I can see the entire the entirety of both radius and ulna. Uh, positioning evaluation. <clears throat> no rotation at the wrist and at the elbow joint. I see the elbow joint demonstrated well here, and I see that the wrist is not rotated. These bones are stacked on top of each other because the hand is sideways like this. The exposure factors are optimal. That's kind of goofy because you don't, may not know what optimal means, right? Um, so let me just make it simple here uh, and we'll make it complicated later. Okay. So you look at the arm. The bone 
shouldn't look completely white. Now we, sh we say, offhand, we say, bones look white on x-ray, right? That's just kind of a simple way to, to talk about it. Bones don't actually look white on x-ray. They're different shades of gray. They should never look bright white. That's not good. Uh, so what you should see with bones, you should see that there is a dark center to the bone. Notice how each bone has kind of a darker center. And then once you look, get towards the sides, like the walls of the bone, it looks dense and white, right? Um, the, by the way, the whiter something is on x-ray, the denser it is in real life. Okay, the blacker something looks on x-ray, the less dense it is in real life. So air on x-ray looks black, whereas like metal on x-ray looks bright, bright white. Okay. Uh, so you should see the bones and you should see that there's a, a darker center to the bone. Okay. You should see that there's a whiter, denser, uh, what we call the cortex or the outside of the bone. And you should see soft tissue, right? You can see that there is some, some muscle and other things next to the bone, right? And you should see black background. That's optimal exposure factors. I'll explain it more complicated at a later date. But to make it simple, that's kind of the deal. Lastly, side marker, left or right. Um, you guys doing a medical record in, in MA class right now? Or no? No? Okay, my colleague, people are on medical record right now. Uh, well, the medical record, um, what do we know about it? What do we know about a medical record? Somebody's medical record. Mm. It's, the, it's information about the patient, right? If the patient were to have to sue a doctor for treatment, what is the medical record used for? Proof. Proof, right? So the medical record is a legal document, okay? Your radiographs that you create are part of the medical record. So can you infer then that your radiographs are a legal document? Right? Yeah. yeah. So your radiographs have to have certain things on them. Uh, one, uh, since they're digital, the information is attached to it, not directly on the radiograph, but radiographs used to, I'll show you some, radiographs used to have the patient's name and date of birth and date of exam right on the piece of film. Now it's just attached to the, to, to the by a computer file. But what you must legally show on a radiograph is a right or left anatomic side marker. Okay? That's why we give them to you guys. We don't give them to you guys just because we like to give left and right side markers out. They're a legal requirement for an x-ray tech to have them and use them. This is a digital marker. Notice how it's just kind of put on there uh, from the computer. Um, there is actually still a legal requirement to use hard right and left markers. They, should, they have to be on the, the image, at, on the receptor at the time of creating the image. There are times when you can't do that, okay? So you can't always do it, and uh, that's okay. You just do it as much as possible, okay? So we give you markers, you should be using them. Um, I know you're gonna tell me when you get out to clinics that no one's using them. That's because x-ray techs get lazy as they, as they get into their careers. Um, try not to get lazy. I still religiously use mine. Every time I make a radiograph, I use my marker, unless it can't fit. Like if I do like a finger radiograph and it's like my collimated field is so small that I can't put my marker in there and have it be seen, then of course I'm not gonna use it. Or like a, if, they're, if the body part is so large that it takes up the entire receptor and if I, if I risk putting the, the marker somewhere where it might cut off some anatomy, then I won't use it. But in all other cases, you must use an anatomic side marker. All right, placing radiographs for viewing. You should position the radiograph as if the radiograph being viewed is the patient facing the doctor, okay? So on the screen, their left should be on your right, their right should be on your left, okay? Patient's right to the viewer's left. Laterals should be done as being viewed by the projection. So picture yourself as the x-ray beam traveling through space. That's how you position the patient's laterals on the screen. Decubitus, I won't really talk about right now, but decubitus are projections that are done with the patient laying down. Um, you, you typically want to put the side facing up um, towards the top of the screen, but it, you sort of ignore that one for right now. We'll talk about decubitus at a later date. limbs, extremities, put them in anatomic position. 
So what's the anatomic position for the hands? Are the fingers pointed up or down? Down. Down. So hands on the hands in in anatomic position. You know, hands are hands are sort of a, hands are. You know, I'll just go ahead and say it. hands are hands don't follow the rule. Hands are positioned with the fingers facing up. Um, same with wrists, but forearms and elbows and humeruses are positioned from anatomic position. This is sort of misleading here. Hey, actually, actually, it says it right here. Hands and feet digits facing up. Um, so, like here. This is a wrist, so I'll come back to where I was so you can keep in your notes. This is a wrist series, a three view wrist series. Um, the fingers are pointed up on the screen here. And that's pretty much the only thing I have for that. But if this were, if we were looking at the forearm, the elbow, or the humerus or shoulder, the hands get pointed towards the ground. The fingers would be pointed towards the ground in the way you orient it. Okay. Um, there's other little nuances I'll have to get to when we get to them. Um, but yeah, keep on going here. Okay, so anatomic position for the limbs, except when you get to the hands and the feet, the digits have to be pointed up towards the top of the screen. So the way I was always taught this is if I'm a patient and you're, uh, you guys are out here being the doctor, okay, and I say my hand hurts, I'm not gonna come up to you and go, my hand hurts, right? I'm gonna go, my hand hurts. Right? I'm going to put my hand, fingers facing up towards you, right? Same thing with my wrist. I'm going to say my wrist hurts, okay? But if I want you to look at my forearm, I'm going to go, my forearm hurts, right? And I'm going to put my hands down. Same thing with my elbow, right? I'm not going to go, my elbow hurts, right? Same thing with the humerus. I'm going to put my hands, fingers facing down. So the way I position the radiographs on the screen is the way the patient would approach the doctor and say, this hurts on me, okay? Um, so, and if, like, if I wanted to say, like, from the, if I wanted to talk about a lateral image, like the elbow, we would we would come out. I come up to you and I say, "My elbow hurts," and this is how I would position the elbow on the screen with the fingers pointed down, right? If I wanted to show you the side of my elbow, from the, the side of my elbow hurts, this is a lateral view of the elbow, right? I don't come up to you and I, I don't go, "My elbow hurts," right? I would come up to you and say, "My elbow hurts." Notice the difference in orientation. The forearm runs horizontally across the screen versus vertically across the screen. So just think about the way you would show a, phys a physician your painful area on your body, and that's how you should orient each image on the screen. Okay. Regarding chest x-rays. Regarding chest x-rays, um, when you position for a chest x-ray, an AP chest x-ray will show the left marker oriented in the correct, the, giving you the, the correct look. The L looks like a normal L, okay? When you position for PA, here, the heart, notice the heart's on the left side of the body here. Left side, the heart's also on the left side of the body over here too. By the way, this person's probably got congestive heart failure. This is fluid in their fissures. This white, these white lines are fluid in between the lobes of their lungs. They have CHF. They're gonna not do so hot. Um, we can talk about reading x-rays later. Notice the left on over here. It's turned around backwards. Okay. When you do a PA projection with the patient's chest against the image receptor, um, if you don't flip your marker around uh, so the L looks backwards to you, it'll show up looking backwards on the, on the monitor. Okay. So every time you do a chest x-ray, your left marker needs to be flipped around so it looks backwards to you. Every time you do a PA chest or just leave it the normal direction. It's always gonna show up looking backwards. Just part of the deal. Um, just something to think about. Um, lateral chest x-rays. The left marker indicates that this was a left lateral chest x-ray. The left side of the patient was touching the image receptor. Okay. Indicate left for left lateral put a right if you put them in right lateral. Now, I should say, we don't generally perform chest x-rays in the right lateral position. And it has to do with the same thing I talked about earlier for the chest, the magnification of the heart. Okay. The heart is larger to the left side of the body. And by putting it closer to the image receptor, we can minimize magnification of the heart. Okay. Um, so we do a left lateral to minimize magnification of the heart on chest x-rays. 
This on the right is a decubitus chest x-ray. I know that because there's an arrow indicating that this is up. Top of the screen is up. That arrow shows me that. And um, they are. this is the right side of their body and the left side of their body is over here. This is a, a left marker kind of hiding over here. I think it's even turned upside down. Um, this is a decubitus x-ray. The patient was laying on their side and, inst and instead of... Um, the x-ray beam coming down on the patient on the table, the x-ray beam was shot across the table like this. And it's, it's, an, it's another type of chest x-ray done to uh, assist in viewing fluid or air levels in the chest. Okay. If we were looking for fluid in the chest, I'd be looking at the left side of the chest down towards the table. If I were looking for air, I'd be looking at the chest uh, that's up on the top, the top part of the screen. Um, decubitus x-rays are ordered in um, conjunction with the PA and lateral. They're done as an additional image. Not always, but they are done as that additional image. Okay. So that's it for this section here. Um, I want you guys to take a five-minute break. Okay. Let me reset, and then we will continue on, and we're going to talk about chest positioning. I think they're doing some scanning in here, so let's go around if we have to go up to the other side of the school. And go out that door and around. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. That's all good. Um, here's a black one. Thank you. Uh -huh.